I'm really pleased to introduce you to Nigel Gilbert from University of Surrey. He's going to tell us all about handling complexity, which is also slightly terrifies me most of the time. So he's going to enlighten us. Yes? Excellent. OK, I'll hand over to Nigel. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, I'll talk, um, I am actually going to talk about what complexity is, so those people who don't know what it is, don't worry about it. I'm, I, I will attempt to explain in, in uh, 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 about two minutes, which is about all it takes. Um, so, actually Well, first technical problem. This was working before, but it isn't working now. Now it is. Yes. Okay. I'm also going to talk about a policy evaluation, which I think many of you have uh, encountered in one way or, or another. And, uh, well, what do we do in policy evaluation? Uh, well, we want to know what change has happened as a result of implementing some policy. Is it what we expected? Is it what we want? Uh, and so the way we do that is we uh, measure something uh, before we implement the policy, uh, and then we implement the policy, and then we measure what uh, happened afterwards, and as it were, we subtract one from the other, and that's the effect of, of, of the policy. What could be simpler? <laughs> well, as we shall see, it's, it's not quite so simple, and uh, here's a little advert to start off with. Uh, CCAN, which stands for the Centre for the Evaluation of Complexity Across the Nexus, and I've spent the last six years thinking that was a very silly name, um, CCAN, uh, has on its website uh, something called the uh, Complexity Evaluation Toolkit, uh, which we wrote to try and explain uh, why it isn't so simple and what you should do about it. And uh, one of the things I'm going to, 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 to summarise it, it very briefly in this talk is, is what it says uh, in, in, that, uh, in that toolkit or framework or something. Um, OK, so uh, what is evaluation? We'd better start off by defining that. Uh, I won't read out that long text, but that is, as it were, the official definition of uh, evaluation. And uh, as you can see, it emphasises looking at the actual implementation and impacts of policy. Uh, it talks about the effects, costs and benefits that were realised as a result of that policy uh, and also a demonstration of the value for money. And uh, those are the kinds of things that the government uh, is interested in when it comes to policy evaluation. Now, uh, the, this uh, quote comes from something called the Magenta Book, uh, which actually Rosie, I noticed, mentioned briefly uh, this morning. Uh, the Magenta Book is the official uh, guide published by Her Majesty's Treasury uh, about how to do policy evaluation for in, 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 in government. And... Um, let me uh, kind of quickly tell you a story about it. In, in 2003, uh, the first edition of the Magenta Book came out. Uh, it's called the Magenta Book for the very obvious reason that it's magenta uh, on the cover, uh, nothing else. Uh, although there's also, uh, a, in fact, there's a whole rainbow of them. There's a the green book, which is about appraisal. There's an aqua book, and, and so on and so forth. But it's the Magenta Book that's about evaluation. And if we look at the uh, contents list of the 2003 edition of the Magenta Book, uh, this is what it is about, says. It tells you about uh, basic statistics, about sampling, about methods of data collection, about randomised control trials. In other words, its notion of what policy evaluation is uh, is very much like uh, what one might do if one was testing a drug and evaluating the efficacy of a, of, of a drug. Um, notice at the end there's a sort of nod to qualitative research. Well, um, this is a real example 
what would you, how would you evaluate the success Oh, well. The success of uh, uh, I mean knocking at the door uh, 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 of a, a policy, a DEFRA policy. In fact, this was uh, to evaluate the success of a policy that subsidised uh, local authorities improving and making new public footpaths. How do you assess? How do you do a randomised control trial? Think about it. How do you assess the uh, cost benefit of a new foot bath. Um, and this was the kind of problem that uh, uh, caused SICAN to be uh, uh, started in the first place. That the kind of uh, advertised, recommended way of doing policy evaluation just didn't seem to work very well uh, when it was applied, uh, at least in some government departments. Specifically, well, when SICAN started, it was DEFRA. Uh, it was what was then called DEC, then turned into Bayes, and now turned into uh, DESNES. Um, uh, and also uh, Natural England and the uh, Food Standards Agency and the uh, Environment Agency, all of whom had these kinds of issues about how to do policy evaluation when it came to dealing with complex policies. And it's policies that deal with complex uh, situations uh, and, and, and environments. So CCAN, uh, we, we say that we, this is our kind of mission statement, transforming the practice of policy evaluation across the food, energy, water and environmental domains to make it fit for a complex world. Well, I've been talking, say, to using that word complexity or complex rather a lot. What, what, what actually does it mean? <clears throat> the easiest way of thinking about this is in terms of uh, the contrast between simple, complicated and complex. If you have a recipe for uh, baking muffins, um, which I do quite often, it's a nice recipe. <laughs> you, you, you can have it any time you like. Um, then... You follow a recipe. You follow a set of steps. And you're you know, more or less guaranteed to get a set of muffins out at the other end. And they're more or less guaranteed to be uh, much the same. Unless you're a really bad cook. That's simple. Let's now suppose you're a rocket scientist building a rocket. There's a lot that goes into a rocket. A lot of physics, a, a, a lot of engineering, a lot of bits. That's complicated. And then, suppose that you're bringing up a child. Well, as, as the saying goes, there's, there's no, uh, ch uh, you know, uh, children don't come with user manuals. That's complex. There's no real recipe about how to bring up a, a, a child, and you can't really anticipate uh, what that child is going to turn into uh, when it's born. That's typically uh, an example of what I mean by complex. Not complicated. You know, complex systems can actually be rather simple, uh, but they do have some other characteristics. So for me, a complex system is one that consists of a lot of bits, interacting components, to be formal about it. And the interactions lead to non-linear, not straight, non-proportional and emergent phenomena. And often the components themselves change over time. They evolve. So here's some examples. Brains, consisting of lots of neurons. Crowds, consisting of lots of people. Organisations consisting of lots of people in structures and nation states. All of these are, from my point of view anyway, complex systems. And okay, so if they're complex systems, what's common about them? They're obviously very different, but there are some commonalities that are interesting. And here's a long list, I'm not going to talk about all of them. 
but a long list of the properties that complex systems may, uh, uh, may exist. So they may change, they may adapt to the environment in which they find themselves. There may be emergence of uh, f things that come up from the interaction between uh, the, the various elements. So, well, there are many, many examples, but uh, think, since we're in a university, uh, think of the, um, as it were, the rules and regulations, the finance uh, policies and so on, uh, which govern a university. That's an emer we can think of that as an emergent <coughs> phenomenon coming from the interaction of the academics and other members of the university. They self-organise. Well, again, if you're using a university, then you know, there's a degree of self-organisation. Um, some people may uh, contest how much. Uh, there's feedback in many of these. Uh, I'll talk about levers and hubs in a moment. Uh, I've already uh, uh, mentioned non-linearity. Uh, I'll talk about tipping points and path dependency in a moment. And uh, they are open systems. And uh, let's just talk a little moment about that. An open system is, a, in contrast to the sort of engin an engineering system, which is typically closed, you can clearly define what it is, an open system has many links uh, and connections with its wider environment, and therefore it's affected by things that are happening elsewhere. So um, here's a, a classic example of uh, an open system, a hospital, where you get bed blocking because there's another system called social care, or, which is not uh, receiving patients as they uh, uh, when, when they should be leaving hospital. I, meant, I said I'd talk about levers and hubs. Um, uh, th this is a, a way of thinking about uh, the flow of communication or interaction in a, a complex system. So that some people or some uh, items, some components generally in a complex system uh, may be gatekeepers or hubs or uh, particular uh, 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 foci of communication or may block uh, communication. Self-organisation as uh, an, an emergence I, I, I mentioned already so and here's another example uh, where formation of social movements, social norms and new markets all of which emerge from uh, the interaction of individuals uh, or organisations. Adaptation and feedback. Um, so that uh, uh, in, here's a, a couple of examples of, of that where uh, uh, actors or components in a system may adapt to the situation in which they're, they're found in unexpected ways, sometimes desirable and unexpected, but sometimes undesirable ways. You, you may have uh, come across the... Uh, situation that was in Northern Ireland where people were heating uh, empty barns because it turned out that a, uh, a subsidy scheme for uh, renewable energy made it profitable for people to use energy in certain situations uh, and so you got you know, a, a big scandal about this uh, using um, uh, renewable uh, it basically claiming a renewable heating subsidy in a way uh, that was not expected and not desirable. And then we've got uh, feedback systems. Uh, another well-known example is the effect of, uh, of methane emissions uh, uh, causing uh, global warming, which generates uh, yet more uh, methane emissions. And then there's a ni nice example here of a tipping point, uh, if domestic social panels um, where uh, things you put on the roof um, and this is just a, a growth, uh, a plot of the uh, price of a, solar, of a solar panel on a time scale from 1975 to 2015 and the number of such solar panels actually installed on people's roofs and as you can see the um, 
number of uh, installations grew pretty much exponentially from about 2005. The interesting thing about this is that it didn't grow starting in 1980, where the uh, price of solar panels went down. It took something like, uh, what, to getting on for 25 years before we got to the point where the exponential rise started. Why was that? Well, one of the reasons is that there was a tipping point because, at, at, at the uh, 2005 kind of area because it took that long uh, before government policy, the so-called feed-in tariff, uh, had caught up with the need for uh, uh, encouraging a market in, in so installation of solar, solar panels. And also because... And this is another typical example of a complex system, the way complex systems work, is that uh, people uh, thought that installing a solar panel was a good idea because their neighbours had. You got a social infection, an epidemic, uh, as it were, of installations. OK, so... As I've implied, all public policy domains are, to my mind, complex in the ways that we've been talking. Stop it. Uh, that's better. Um, and to handle such complexities, we need new ways of doing evaluation. Um, and uh, what, that's what CCAN has been working on. We need an analysis that highlights the practical implications of system complexity, as I've been trying to generically in doing so far, and challenges users' assumptions about linearity and, 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 and such like. We need to, uh, a method of uh, process of evaluation that is stakeholder-owned and uh, that... Uh, captures what matters on the ground and that is essentially a process uh, with getting users to ask new types of questions and to think back to the sort of 2003 RCT uh, Bible, the Magenta book, and see how different those sorts of principles are from that. Um, so, we're with all of that, so that we can produce an evaluation design uh, that is based on a theory, a theory of how things change, um, a theory that we can then test in our evaluation, together with a set of methods about how we might uh, test each of the mechanisms or processes uh, that we imagine have been, are, are, are happening. And, a, and to do this in a way that is iterative, that allows for the possibility of, of, of change as we understand more of the system that we're evaluating and, indeed, as the system that we're evaluating itself changes, uh, adapts and evolves. Well, we've, um, one of the things that uh, we... Uh, developed in, in CCAN is actually something that already has been mentioned, I think, a number of times uh, over the last uh, uh, day or so, which is participatory system mapping. And one of the ways in which CCAN suggests evaluation should proceed is by starting off by doing a participatory system map of the domain that is being evaluated. In fact, we have some free software which helps doing that and there's a, a link there. Uh, this is just a system map from some uh, slightly random uh, example. I can't actually read it uh, as to which, uh, what, what, what it is. It doesn't really matter, but it gives you the idea of uh, what a system map might look like. And then once we've done that, then we need to engage in a learning loop because, uh, as I've been emphasising, you know, com complex systems change. We need to, and we, the, 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 the people involved in the evaluation need to learn, the policy people need to learn about the system. And here's the kind of uh, learning loop uh, that uh, 
that, that we have suggested in terms of building a theory of change, planning for how that theory will, will, will change as we learn more, monitoring and evaluating uh, what is happening on the ground, not just at the end of some period of implementation, but as the policy is implemented, reflecting, uh, do more learning more, and then closing the loop, changing the uh, amending, editing, improving the theory of change. So the kind of key principles, and there's much more detail in the complexity evaluation toolkit that I mentioned right at the beginning, um, it says, you know, start early, don't wait to design your evaluation until your policy has already been implemented. Your evaluation should be designed at the same time as your policy is designed. Use a theory of change to inform uh, what's going on. Don't aim for perfection. I, by, that's there because a complex system is, in principle, often, well, or, 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 often in principle, uh, impossible to understand perfectly in advance. So trying to make sure that every, uh, every I, uh, I is dotted and T is crossed is, 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 is futile. Stay flexible. Communicate widely and often, which I think is also a theme of the last two days, and plan for change. Well, um, we... Let me use the complexity evaluation tool framework uh, as an example. Um, we learnt our own lessons in a sense that we uh, developed that in conjunction with DEFRA. Um, it's now uh, available on the DEFRA website uh, for public use. Uh, but um, the DEFRA then commissioned uh, an independent evaluator to evaluate the complexity evaluation framework, <laughs> which was great because uh, actually they came up with some 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 improvements, and there's now what you find on the on the web on the DEFRA website is is as were well, version two. Um, hopefully, maybe one day there'll be a version three. And the, in, uh, it also uh, it worked in the sense that uh, there is an increasing interest in complex evaluation in, in, in government. Um, uh, there are explicit references to, to, to uh, uh, the toolkit, the framework, and to, uh, to CCAM in uh, invitations to tender coming out of at, at, at government. Um, and uh, the, the kind of tide is, is, is flowing in our direction, I, I'm, I'm really glad to say. Um, and there, I will leave that there in, for a moment or two. Though these are the, some links if you want to follow up the detail, which I haven't had time uh, to talk about, uh, it, it, you can find uh, at, those, at those links. And uh, the, the uh, presentation slides will be available anyway. Right. So, thank you very much. We have uh, four minutes left for questions. Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Travis Cohen. I'm from Exeter. Um, so uh, th really interesting stuff. Um, I'm wondering, so you have these uh, great sort of principles that sort of start early. Um, what, we have, I often find that organizations come to me and they've already started, right? They might have a theory of change. But I'm kind of coming to them after the fact. I wonder if you could t speak just a little bit more about 
in that sort where you know you have you're not there from the beginning uh how you kind of adapt uh like no pun intended um this these sorts of principles to that sort of situation or maybe you weren't yeah you weren't around to sort of put in place these these principles yeah I I indeed uh, i think your experience is uh, quite common <laughs> that people, unfortunately, think, ah, oh, mm, we just implemented something, perhaps we ought to evaluate it. Um, and, uh, well, it, it, I, I think the, the answer is kind of simple. I mean, we, we, you won't get as good a, a, a job uh, done as if you just started at the beginning, um, but you can still do quite a lot. Uh, and... Um, you know, what we advertise as, as, as being the best practice is to start off with some kind of system map, some system uh, understanding, develop from that a theory of change, uh, develop from that a set of indicators that you want to, 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 to measure. Um, and I have uh, experience of doing that backwards. <laughs> you start off with the indicators, you then work to a theory of change, and then you do the system map. It doesn't work as well, but it's still helpful. Uh, and, and remember that what we're suggesting is that this is not a what, none of these are a one off process. Yeah, you should do all of these things all the time, if you like. Okay, so you don't start right at the beginning, but you can, you can carry on. Thank you very much, Nigel. Um, I, I suppose you, you had that helpful slide about participatory systems mapping, and you were recommending that as a practice. And one of the things that we're exercised about in Access is how we incorporate equality, diversity, and inclusion principles into everything that we do. So I wonder if you could say something about how you know, uh, how you evaluate the quality of that participatory approach in terms of ensuring the kind of comprehensiveness of the voices that are part of that process in the first place. How do you know that you're, or, 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 or have you got any guidance to offer on, on the EDI aspect of that and, and whether your evaluation has picked up on those issues? Um. Actually, that's a really hard question because I think I'm going to turn it back to you. <laughs> um, the way that we have in, I mean, CCAN has always worked very closely with policy analysts in 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 government, um, with a, a few minor exceptions. Well, there are a few important exceptions, actually. Um, we haven't attempted to. Uh, work with uh, yeah, citizens or publics. Um, and so in the context of working with policy analysts, um, I think we, we, we can suggest issues about you know, EDI or in, indeed widening the range of stakeholders, but essentially it's their job to, to define who it is that they think should be brought into the into the, in, in, into the story rather than ours. Um, but uh, I think nowadays we are increasingly, indeed, widening the participation, moving into new areas. And I think it is a real issue. Um, it's partly about the framing of the problem, that uh, if you're not careful, you can frame the problem in a way that actually exclude, excludes whole sets of, uh, of interested parties makes life easy for the policy makers, but probably not, uh, doesn't improve the policy. But uh, that's one of the things that I think Access uh, has and will continue to help with. So thank you very much. If there, unless there any, oh, there's a, yes, please. Oh. <coughs> they won't hear you otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, Clive Mitchell from Nature Scott. So yeah, really interesting. Um, so as you say, with complex systems, you you nudge it, push it, intervene in one way or another, and you don't really know what the results are going to be. Um, so, but thinking about that in, as working for a public body, working on issues to do with nature and climate, and so on, 
often politicians want to know, you know, how much of this species there is going to be in that place and or you know how fast we can reduce emissions into or sequester emissions into biological systems and so on and so on which are clearly meaningless questions but they're the ones they like to ask and so we have to answer them and so on um so i'm wondering how that relates then to your if you don't know what the what the answer or what the outcome is going to be of the system uh how do you how do you design your theory of change um, to reflect that uncertainty in, in terms of the dynamics of the system and what's actually going to happen as a result of what you do? Well, I, th I think there's two things I need to say there here. Um, first of all, there may be uncertainty, but it's not total uncertainty. Um, trivial uh, illustration of that, I mean, if, if I were to try and predict the, uh, the, the outside temperature uh, of uh, next year's access conference, yeah, um, I, I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know whether it's going to rain or sun, but I can be absolutely sure that it's not going to be 200 degrees centigrade, even with global warming. Um, so, yeah, uncertainty, but that, there, there are boundaries around that uncertainty. Um, and uh, secondly, uh, I don't think the fact that we uh, ha aren't have a, there's a degree of uncertainty uh, means that we can't have a theory of change. Uh, we can have you know, lots of theories about, and we can test those the, effect, uh, the efficacy of those theories without being able to make, as it were, point predictions. Or, as to the kind of political with a small p issue that. Uh, politicians and, and, and indeed everybody wants to know exactly what the temperature is going to be next year um, well I think we just have to be realistic and say you know you're, you're asking uh, impossible questions sorry minister uh, we can't tell you that um, either that or we make up a number <laughs> there was a question at the is there time or don't I now. Oh. <laughs> I'd like it's to. Really to, quick. Oh, I don't know. Don't worry. I'll ask, okay. I'll ask Nigel. I just wanted to finish off by saying that uh, that I talked about CCAN and the people who who who've worked in the CCAN team are a fantastic team, but I also want to acknowledge the help of. Uh, government departments, let us put it, and policy analysts, and the people that we have worked with who have been a really important part of the development of CCAP. So, uh, Perfect example of co-production. Indeed, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.